And we are live with Natalie Wexler, education author, uh, education writer, reporter, author, um, and someone uh, who's become an expert specifically on how we teach reading or reading instruction and the damage that we do when we don't get it right, specifically to kids that need the best possible reading instruction. And uh, I want to dive right in. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So at the start, I want to say, or I want to ask about, I always want to know how people come to issues that they stick with. Like, you know, they, <laughs> you grab onto something, you think it's really important and you run with it. So you, um, at some point, latched on to this, uh, to the issue of reading and reading instruction and how we're doing it. And you could have focused on anything. You could have focused on math. You could have focused on, you know, science, social science, civics, you know, uh, all kinds of things. Why reading? Well, I'd say it really does go beyond reading, but um, I, and, and it even has some implications for math. But what happened was about 10, maybe 11 years ago now, I live in Washington, D.C., and there was, a, there was a lot of education reform activity here. And this seemed to me an incredibly important issue, specifically what is often called the achievement gap, the gap in test scores between haves and have-nots. And, uh, you know, it seems like we were not making good on our promise of education as an engine of social mobility. And, and I wanted to know why. And I did a couple of things. Um, I got involved in some education reform activity, joined the board of a charter school. I also, having a background in journalism, started writing about education, partly because I felt it wasn't getting enough coverage. There's a lot going on here. And I was really writing locally. Um, and partly because, for me, the best way to figure something out is to write about it. Uh, and I wanted to figure this out. And reading, uh, it was, you know, I wasn't setting out specifically to focus on reading, but what I um, stumbled across really was that the way we approach reading in elementary school uh, doesn't line up with what scientists have found out about how reading, and I'm specifically focusing here on comprehension. There were also problems on the decoding side with how we do that, but how we approach reading comprehension in almost every school in the country does not line up with what scientists have found about how reading comprehension works. And that has huge implications for all sorts of other educational issues that we are trying to fix. But I realized that if we didn't fix that one, all of these other education issues were likely to remain with us. And, um, and I can go into that more, but I, I, I'm not the first person to come across this, I should say, if people have been talking about this problem for over 30 years. But I thought I knew a lot about education. I'd been writing about it as a journalist. I was on the board of this charter school. I read all sorts of things, gone to expert panel discussions, and nobody had ever mentioned the way we approach reading comprehension as a problem. And it seemed to me that what was needed was a book that would get this issue into the national public conversation about education. Um, and I, what, what it seemed was needed, you know, it had been written about, but in a kind of academic, maybe dry way. And it is a pretty complicated subject. And having a background in journalism, it seemed to me what was needed was a more journalistic approach that would be more engaging, tell stories. Um, and so that's what I tried to do in this book, The Knowledge Gap. Hmm. And it, can, can you locate where the problem is? So we have uh, 150 years of American public education. I think the assumption is that throughout all of that time, we're making advances, we're learning things, and we're incorporating the things that we learn, and it's showing up in the classroom as an end product at some point. You just said the science doesn't agree yeah. with the way we were doing things. What happened? <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and I think a lot of what happened was that uh, the education schools developed along a different path from the rest of academia. Uh, there are historical reasons for that, but the result has been a real lack of communication between what goes on in ed schools and what goes on with the rest of, even on the same campus you know, of, a, of a college or university. And so what's being taught in ed schools about developmental psychology does not, often does not correspond with what's being taught on the other side of campus to undergraduates or graduate students in regular psychology courses, cognitive psychology, the science of learning. And in fact, what's being taught in ed schools often contradicts what's being taught in, in, in psychology departments and what psychologists have found out about how learning works in general, not just reading comprehension. So I think those are the deep roots of the problem. And then there's been this whole sort of superstructure of, of 
instructional materials and policy and, um, and you know, reformers and policymakers, especially I would say the education reform community, well-intentioned as it is, and, you know, I was, I had, was and I am part of it, has tended to look more at inputs like teacher quality or outputs like test scores and not very much at what actually goes on in the classroom and uh, crucially, what is being taught? What is the substance of the curriculum? And often, especially in elementary schools, there really isn't any substance. And that's a huge problem. Do you think that part of that is because um, it's easier to talk about inputs and outputs and not mess with what happens in the middle because there's so much resistance to uh, metals being meddlesome? Like, you know, if we just set the standards, tell people what we expect, but let them get there in many different ways, like however they want, we'll be respecting their professionalism. You know, I, I do think that's been part of it. And it's sort of like, well, we're not experts on teaching. Let's leave that to the experts. And teachers, educators do have a lot of expertise. The, the problem is that their training has been in, in many ways, you know, they, they haven't been given some information that's really important. And that could actually make their job easier. Um, and, and make learning easier for a lot of students. But maybe I should back up a bit and then explain a little bit more for those who may not know uh, what's in the book. W what exactly uh, is the disconnect between how reading comprehension is taught and what science has found about how it works? Um, and and the, the way it's taught and the way it's tested, reading comprehension, is um, based on the assumption that it's a set of skills, sort of comprehension skills mm -hmm. and strategies like finding the main idea, making inferences. There's a whole bunch of them, a sequence of events, um, comparing and contrasting, all sorts of, and uh, that's what those reading comprehension tests seem to be assessing. And it's also the way instruction has been organized even before the tests came along, but the, the tests have made reading and reading comprehension so much more important that it's really taken over a lot of the curriculum. And there may be a skill of the week that the teacher focuses on. Maybe he or she will model that skill. Um, let's say it's comparing and contrasting, choose a book that lends itself to that. And then the other part of this system is kids go off and practice the skills on books or texts that have been determined to be at their individual reading level. Um, and it doesn't that the focus is not on the content of the texts. Uh, it's the kind of fiction or could be on random topics. The idea is if they get good at finding the main idea, they'll be able to apply that skill to any text that's put in front of them, whether it's a passage on an end of the year reading test or a high school textbook down the road. But what scientists have found out about reading comprehension is that the most important factor, not the only factor, but a really important factor is how much knowledge and vocabulary you already have relating to that topic. And so you may be very good at finding the main idea in a, if you, let's say you know a lot, a lot about baseball and you're reading something about baseball, no, no problem finding the main idea. I give you a text on, you know, quantum physics or even just, you know, U.S. history or whatever. And if you don't know much about it, you're going to have a hard time finding the main idea. I would have a hard time finding the main idea, probably even about a passage on baseball, because I don't know any, much about baseball myself. But it's not that you've suddenly lost the ability to find the main idea. It's that the text ha has assumed a lot of information and vocabulary that you don't have. And so with these tests, they try to test skills, but they end up being tests of general knowledge because they don't they don't test kids on anything they might have learned in school in terms of topic. In fact, they're designed to avoid topics that kids might have learned in school because the idea is we're just going to test skills. But if you're a kid who hasn't been lucky enough to just pick up the knowledge that's assumed in that reading passage about the Inuit or Amelia Earhart or whatever, you're not going to get an opportunity to demonstrate your skill at finding the main idea because you can't understand that passage. You know, this one around uh, knowledge being really important keeps coming up and again. And I have like a little bit of confusion, like a general confusion. Of, it's a chicken and the egg type of confusion about it. So you don't know something. So you read something and then you know something that you didn't know before. But if it requires you to know something when you read something to know what you're reading, you know, I, yeah. it seems a real circular. So let's just say, for instance, I, which I did, I'm, I'm living on Industry Street in New Orleans. Um, you know, I'm in sixth grade, which I was. And I read something um, in Dickens or I read something in a book that takes place in London, England or somewhere very far away. 
And uh, I know nothing of it. I have potholes in the street in front of my house. I'm, you know, if I've read something about uh, Creole culture, I would know all about it. <laughs> if I read yeah. something about Mardi Gras, I would know all about it. But if I read Dickens, I don't know anything about it. But then when I'm done with Dickens, I know a little something about, um, you know, what they call the trunk of a car instead of calling it a trunk. And, you know, there are things that I know only because I was able to access it through reading, not because I already knew. Yes. I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, and especially adults are able to, or, or profi proficient readers with a pretty good knowledge base are able to acquire a lot of new knowledge through their reading. It's not that you can only read and learn things from books on topics you already know a lot about. Mm -hmm. It's more that at a certain, there's a certain threshold and there's, there's been some research into this. Um, it's something like, let's say it's 59% of the vocabulary if you know that percentage of it then you're, you're going to be able to understand what you're reading you're probably gonna have a better chance of absorbing new information from what you're reading and in fact it has been found that prior knowledge of the topic doesn't just enable you to understand a text it also enables you to absorb and retain new information from that mm -hmm. text it's a question of degree and um and and what we need to do to boost reading comprehension. It's not like there's some list of words that kids need to know. It's it's more just expanding knowledge of the world and academic knowledge and vocabulary as much as possible so that they'll not only have heard of a word, but they may have some kids may have several different meanings in their head about it. even a simple word like apple. If there are metaphorical uses of apple, the big apple, there's apple pie, there's <laughs> lots of associations with that word. And at a certain point, you reach a critical mass where you have enough of those words and you understand and have the nuances of enough of those words that you can read and understand pretty much anything that's thrown at you as long as it's not too technical or abstruse. But exactly when that point, actually one commentator, I love this phrase, said you, you need to be having a knowledge party in your head, have enough stuff swimming around in your long-term memory that you can, but it, at what exactly what point that's going to be reached for any particular kid and how that's going to relate to what happens to be on any particular test, that's, we can't, we can't pinpoint that threshold exactly. Um, so we just, and the thing is, you know, um, I spent for the book, I spent a couple, a, a year, a school year following a couple of classrooms. And I've been in a lot of classrooms, talked to a lot of teachers who have used both kinds of curricula, the, the dominant, you know, let's focus on main idea kind of curriculum, comprehension curriculum. And, and this newer kind of curriculum that actually does focus on building kids' knowledge about a whole bunch of stuff. And what I've seen and what teachers have told me is the kids really enjoy learning about a bunch of stuff, much more than they enjoy practicing finding the main idea. Kids, young kids, they're curious about the world. They ask all sorts of really good questions and they love feeling like they know stuff, they're, like they're experts on something. So it's not just good for kids to give them access to knowledge, it actually, uh, they, they like it. I'm kind of laughing because um, the first book that I read all the way through the end was Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret um, mm -hmm. from Judy Bloom. And I was, I felt so accomplished that I got to the end, but I only read the book because all the girls around me were reading it. And I wanted to see like, I was, you know, like a, like I knew, like I was somehow, I don't know what I was thinking. I was yeah. trying well, to be a ladies man. So I read the whole book from beginning to end. And I learned so much in that book. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I mean, and kids also need to read for pleasure. They need to read fiction and, and, you know, that's important too. But, um, what it, what it had been go happening was that it, this kind of let's let's let kids just choose what they want to read as long as it's easy for them to read. There's a place for that, but it had be, has become in in a sense the the curriculum. Just read and read and read, and you'll be fine. Well, that may work for a subset of kids, but for the majority, they're going to need more guidance than that. They don't know that they might get really interested in dinosaurs or whales or whatever because they don't really know anything about them. And so the curriculum and the teacher needs to be the guide and say, hey, here's some really cool facts actually about whales or dinosaurs. And I think there's also a fairly widespread assumption, at least, you know, I haven't talked to every educator in the country, but I know there's a feeling out there that ugh, facts are boring. Kids don't, aren't interest, going to be interested in facts and it's not good for them because we really need, need them to do is develop their critical thinking skills. And they can always look up facts. But 
I, kids really are interested in these facts. I was just listening to a podcast that uh, somebody did with her eight-year-old daughter about one of these new curricula. And three or four times when she was asked, what do you like about it? She said, we get to learn all these facts. <laughs> you know? mm. and the thing is, if you want kids to be able to think critically, not just to understand and absorb and retain what they read, but also analyze it and think critically about it, you do need to, you shouldn't stop with facts, but it needs to start with inform factual information. Because if you don't know a, about a topic, you're not going to be able to think critically about it. And the more you know about a topic, the better able you are to think critically about it. And that's something that's been researched. I want to come back to this uh, idea around um, knowledge. N not come back to it because I'm about to ask a question that leads us there, but about facts and about knowledge, um, begging the question whose facts and whose knowledge? Um, because in some ways there'd be a way looking at the world uh, thinking that there's just objective reality. There's just objective facts. There are things that are just true until you start talking to schools, school districts, school boards, parents, uh, communities, and all of a sudden you realize that facts are relative. The, what we consider to be canonical thinking is actually all dependent on who creates the canon. Like, you know, so so it, it may not be as neutral as we may think, but to get there, part of, so let me ask this, what's the Matthew effect? The Matthew effect, I've heard you talk about this in, in uh, your speaking. What is the Matthew effect? Well, um, and I didn't coin that term, but it, 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 the Matthew effect is a reference to the gospel of St. Matthew and specifically the part that can be rendered as the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And it's, it's a sort of, it's applied in different contexts, but in the context of reading, what it's been used to refer to is the fact that kids who start out with more knowledge and vocabulary, I mean, I'm, when I say knowledge and vocabulary, obviously all kids have knowledge and vocabulary, but I'm really talking about the kind of knowledge and vocabulary that helps you understand what you're reading, more academic, sophisticated knowledge and vocabulary. Um, the kids who start out with more of that, especially in this leveled reading system that we have, they are able to read books with more sophisticated content and more sophisticated vocabulary. And also because knowledge is like Velcro, it, stick, it sticks best to other related knowledge they are able to absorb and retain more sophisticated knowledge and vocabulary. And that in turn enables them to read yet more sophisticated texts and retain more, you know, and it's this kind of snowballing effect. So they're on an upward trajectory, whereas the kids who start out with less of that academic knowledge and vocabulary in our leveled reading system are restricted to simpler books that they can just read on their own with simpler knowledge, information, vocabulary. And they're less likely to be able to retain even that information because they may not have that other half of the Velcro for the new stuff to stick to. And so every year that goes by, if we're not building knowledge for those kids who aren't getting it outside school, this kind of knowledge, they fall farther and farther behind. And that gap gets larger. And so by the time they get to high school, it, it's actually quite large and, and hard to narrow. So that's why it's really important to start giving all kids access to academic knowledge as early as possible. What's that mean? How, how does that work? Well, um, so, you know, the most effective way to do this is through a curriculum that focuses on content rather than on these largely illusory comprehension skills. Um, and, you know, before I stumbled across this, before I started writing about this, I assumed that elementary schools were trying to build kids' knowledge. They were teaching them about history, geography, science. Um, and, and they have in the past done some of that, although history has con been considered to be developmentally inappropriate. But um, what has happened, especially in the last 20 years, with reading and math tests becoming so important, and especially in schools where test scores are low, those... Um, Subjects like social studies, and the, the non-tested subjects, social studies, art, and science have really been marginalized or eliminated from the curriculum. And most of the day is devoted to reading and math. And most of what is devoted to reading is devoted to these reading comprehension skills. But there is a new kind of curriculum. There's half, six or eight new curricula that have been developed in really this last six years or so that are labeled literacy curricula because we got to get this into the reading, the English language arts block. Um, but instead of focusing on these comprehension skills, they do focus, they include a lot of what might be considered social studies and science information. They focus on topics and they spend at least a couple of weeks on a topic because you need, if you're just reading books that clouds one day, zebras the next, 
that's not giving kids an opportunity to really absorb and retain that information. Um, and so the teacher reads aloud about these topics in history or science or what the arts, whatever. And, and they, these curricula all cover different bodies of knowledge in different ways. But they all do have, they all focus on topics, not skills. And they all have the teachers reading aloud to all kids from texts that are more difficult than they could read themselves. And that's really crucial because kids can take in a lot more information through listening than through their own reading um, for a long time, really on average through middle school. And if we want them to understand what they're reading, it's really helpful, as we know from studies, if they are already familiar with that content, then they'll, when they encounter it in their reading, it won't be, they won't be like, what's that? The other thing that's a real factor here in reading comprehension that sometimes doesn't get talked about is that written language is a lot more complex than spoken language. It has its own peculiar syntax and vocabulary. And kids also need to get used to that through listening so that when they come to read it on their own, it'll be familiar to them. So those curricula that are out there, I, I mean, as I said, they're different, but all of them have those two basic characteristics. You know, in one of your talks, you, um, you you slay a lot of uh, sacred cows. So one of the sacred cows that you slay is the Dewey um, problem, or what I call the Dewey problem, which is the idea that you let kids construct their own knowledge, let them, um, when they are naturally curious, let them approach uh, uh, subjects, and they'll, they'll learn everything they need to learn out of it, which isn't a dead idea. That idea is still very much with us, and I don't, you know, I don't want to judge. I don't want to call it either for or, or not, because there's lots, lots of people in the unschooling movement who truly believe that kids um, are learning beings constantly. They're like massive learning beings. And if you were to put them in rich environments, they will learn if you allow them the time and the energy to do it. But you say no. Well, <laughs> not it's so, not just not so me. Fast. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's a lot of scientific research behind that. And, and I think also, you know, Dewey, um, he said a lot of different things. It's not really clear that he meant just let kids explore on their own. I mean, his lab school had a curriculum with a lot of content in it. So, mm -hmm. and of course, we want children to pursue their passions, their interests, to in their things they're curious about. But as I said, a lot of kids don't yet know what they're what they might become interested in. That's one problem. And another problem. I mean, teachers tell me over and over again, my kids got fascinated with this topic in the curriculum that they didn't already know about. Um, and I, the, the other thing to say here is that it has been found through a lot of research studies that when learners don't already know much about a topic, inquiry-based learning or you know just uh, allowing them to sort of discover things for themselves is tremendously inefficient and ineffective. At a certain point when people have enough information about a topic, it definitely would make sense to allow them to pursue things through inquiry. But if you're, if you don't know what questions to ask, then you're really going to be at a disadvantage. And the, the net effect, well-intentioned as these things are, the net effect is to end up holding a lot of kids back. Did I see or hear in something that you said or wrote that one of the one of the parts of good reading is asking yourself quality questions as you're reading. And if you can't ask, if you don't know much, you can't ask yourself quality questions as you're reading. Well, um, that's one of the theories behind comprehension strategies in, in particular. I mean, there is a distinction that some draw between comprehension skills and comprehension strategies. And mm -hmm, the strategies mm -hmm. are more these metacognitive things where you are questioning as yourself as you go along. And it's, this is drawn from a body of research that I guess started in the 1970s where they looked at what do expert readers do to when, when they're, they don't understand something they're reading, what do they do kind of unconsciously? And they found, well, they, they asked them, well, how can I relate this to things I already know? Or how does this paragraph relate to that paragraph? And and there's nothing wrong with asking yourself those questions as you go along. But if you really don't understand what you're reading or you don't have any background or prior knowledge to relate it to, the questions aren't going to help you because you can't answer them. Uh, I'm having such trouble with, and I don't mean to be dense, but I'm having such trouble with this one concept around needing to know, like the, and you have a whole book on the importance of knowledge, the knowledge gap. Um, 
um, and then the importance of, of knowledge as a basis for, for good reading. But here's my problem with it is like, um, I'm not going to know a lot of things, but the way that I'm going to learn about things is reading about them, even if I struggle in the beginning. So um, if I see something pop up in a news article today, for instance, that has a, a, a concept around chemistry, chemistry was never one of the things I focused much on in my life. So I will, as an adult, go in and jump in and look something up and it will look pretty daunting and I will struggle with it in the beginning because I don't know much right. about what's behind it but the way that i'm accessing and learning about it is by reading right like i have to go yeah, in and read yeah. so so as i said i mean i understand what you're you're saying and, and i think a lot of people are confused about that because we as educated adults we do i mean i read the newspaper every day and i learn something new that maybe i mean I'm, i could read an article that i about a subject i don't know much about but I can understand it and get information from it. So I understand what you're saying. I think there are a couple of different things here. I think one is um, when we read news, something like a newspaper article, uh, we're not aware of how much general background knowledge and vocabulary we're drawing on. I mean, sometimes when I'm speaking to groups, I show a picture, a, a, a paragraph from um, just really kind of taken at random from the New York times. It's an op-ed and it's, it, it, it's about the, some lawsuits involving Trump's taxes. And in that one paragraph, there's a whole lot of knowledge that's assumed about the legal system, words like appeal, federal appeals court, the Supreme Court, grand jury, subpoena, district attorney. Now, you don't have to have deep knowledge of what a subpoena is, but if you don't, if you've never heard the word subpoena before, you've never heard of district attorney, you just don't know what that is, that's really gonna slow you down and interfere with your comprehension. So. You know, it's a question of degree. And I'd say the other thing here is um, we, we have to consider how many concepts and words some kids don't know, not because they can't learn them, but because no one's ever taught them these things. And, you know, this this is a problem that becomes very apparent, this reading comprehension problem, because very apparent not just in reading, but across the curriculum at the high school level. And so that has led to a lot of reformers or would-be reformers, including me, thinking initially, oh, high school's the problem. And that's where I started. I was like, what, what is wrong with high school? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that the problems start in high school. They actually start long before. But what ha what is happening in our system is kids can get to high school without ever having had any systematic exposure to history, geography, science, or anything but reading and math, especially in schools where test scores are low, because this goes on through middle school, because the tests go through eighth grade. And, you know, I've talked to teachers at various high poverty schools, and this is not lim a problem limited to high poverty schools, but I think it's often seen in its starkest form there, um, who tell me, you know, they, they've had kids at all levels of ability, but they also tell me it's not uncommon to have kids who don't know the difference between a city and a state, who don't know the difference between a country and a continent, who cannot find the United States on a map of the world, who don't have a sense of historical chronology and don't know what the American Revolution was all about. And, and a lot of these things that are really basic prerequisites for understanding not just a newspaper, but you know the high school textbooks they're supposed to be reading. If you're supposed to be reading a textbook on world history and you don't really know what Europe is and you, you don't even have a sense of history because no one's ever taught you these things, that's really gonna interfere with your comprehension and your ability to acquire new information. Let's talk about Let's knowledge. Talk about knowledge. Um, and I'll give you kind of a example. I'm getting some feedback on, um, I think, uh, I may be coming too loud for your speaker, your computer speaker there a little bit. So <clears throat> maybe turn me down a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I'll give you an example. So in the late 1990s, early 2000s, I actually worked in a, a on a project, um, the county, um, that I worked in in the state of Minnesota were actually testing all of the people that were about to be cut off of um, the first group of people that were going to be cut off of welfare. So when welfare reform went in, they, they instituted time limits. And one of the things around time limits was, um, you know, you, you use your five years lifetime limit and then you're done. So, but if we're going to cut you off, we're going to test you to make sure there aren't some additional issues that we maybe uh, are causing you to stay on welfare and then maybe give you an extension. So to get the an extension in, in my county, they test, they tested something like 300 to 400 um, um, families, people, women, moms, mostly. 
And um, one of the things that they were testing for was a world fund of information. And they were testing them for a world fund of information to see if maybe their problem was maybe an IQ problem or a knowledge-based problem that would prevent them from being able to access work and get a job and keep a job. And um, something like 80% of them ended up getting an extension because their world fund of information was seen as being um, um, short, like deficient. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. so what yeah. we were just about to cut them off and cut their families off of everything. And then we extended them because of this. I remember thinking that was my first encountering of the World Fund of Information as an idea. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, thinking- I've never heard that phrase actually myself. But. Yeah, well, they sent out, they had like a small army of psychologists that actually tested all of these, these people for the county. These were county psychologists. And one of the things that they were asked, I was talking to one of my clients who, you know, who went through this and they, they came back with, you know, maybe she should get an extension and we were talking about it. Very bright person, um, not a problem, I think, at all cognitively or whatever. But mm -hmm. one of the things that she told me that they asked were things like, you know, do you know who Babe Ruth is? Right. And I thought, that's weird. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. Why, what does that have to do with intelligence? <laughs> what does that have to do with intelligence or whether or not? And the idea was there's a standard world fund of information that you're supposed to have. And if you don't have it, you're at a disadvantage in society. And I thought, wow, so if we did one and we gave another group this test and put Tupac Shakur in there instead of putting Babe Ruth in there, they would be considered deficient. So it leads me to the question, whose knowledge? Like, whose canon? Yeah. Well, I mean, and that is certainly an excellent question, and it's one I hear a lot. And, um, I mean, one thing I would say is, some of the knowledge I'm talking about as I just went through like the difference between a city and a state. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody owns that knowledge. That's I think we can all agree. Everyone should have access to that knowledge. Um, and the addition, you know, the, in our society, we do make those decisions. We make those decisions at the high school level. There's no high school curriculum that is devoid of content. We have made, we've decided not local, not nationally, but certainly locally what high school students should be studying in history and English. And, and the problem is we haven't given them the background knowledge that will enable them to study those things at a high school level. And we hold them accountable for that. We hold them responsible for that. And it's not their fault that they don't have that background knowledge to do that work we expect of them. It's our fault as a system that we haven't been able to backwards map you know, the knowledge we're going to hold them accountable for and give it to them, provide them with it. So we're making, I mean, the, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying there's any one body of knowledge that is inherently superior to any other. But the fact is that in our society, we do expect people to know certain things and we then withhold them that, that, that information from them on this mistaken theory that all they really need is their skill at finding the main idea. So that's one thing I would say, you know, I. I and you don't believe in that part. that part. You don't believe in the, like, we should be able to give a paragraph to a person and they should be able to decipher, like, what the main idea is in a fairly yeah. neutral way. I, I actually do believe there is a value to that. What I'm saying is we, it is an illusion to think that you can just teach the skill of finding the main idea in the abstract and expect people to be able to apply it generally. I, I, there is certainly a place for asking kids, what is the main idea of this article? But what needs to be in the foreground is the content. And before you get to what is the main idea, let's make sure they understood. I mean, this is another thing that happens, you know, at all levels of education is, I think one of the things that teachers learn in their training is you don't want to waste too much time on lower order things like comprehension. You want to really focus on higher order things like analysis and synthesis. And so they they interpret this. I mean, it, it's a pyramid called Bloom's taxonomy with comprehension at the bottom and like analysis at the top. And the idea is, well, just go straight to the top of that pyramid. But really what Bloom and, and what scientists have found is you can't get to the top of that pyramid unless you spend some time at the bottom. So first you have to ensure that there's basic comprehension. And then, yes, we certainly want, we don't want kids to just memorize facts. We want them to connect those facts. We want them to figure out which ones are more important. How do these things relate to each other? What do I think about all this? And, I, and that's where what we have come to call, you know, strategies or skills and strategies can come in. 
what, so what do you think was really, go, why did this person do this? And, and one wonderful way to get it, to get kids using those strategies in the service of understanding and retaining content is through writing. Um, I think that rather than, okay, let's just practice finding the main idea, that is way more effective um, is to get kids to write about it in a manageable way. And I know you've, you've already done one episode specifically on the writing revolution, which um, is an approach to teaching writing that also simultaneously gets kids to grapple with content and develop their analytical abilities. And I think it's interesting that you start with reading instruction and you end up at writing um, in some ways. And, you know, what writers are often told, there's two things that writers are told that I think are important for this discussion. One of the things is completely wrong, which is um, write like you speak. <laughs> and you already discounted that early in this conversation, like, no, <laughs> speaking yeah. and writing are different kind of animals like language use in them. The second thing you're taught though, I think by good teachers is that right, uh, good good writing is good reading. Um, you know, you, you the, the better reader you are and the more you read and the, the richer your reading habits are, the better your writing is gonna be. Well, actually I would push back on that a little okay. bit. Okay, I love this, all right. <laughs> you know, I, um, I mean, that's often true. And um, you know, I, I, I have seen that, but uh, it's, it's a lot harder to write than it is to read because it's expressive rather than receptive. And so it is possibly possible to be a good reader, even an avid reader, and still not be a really good writer because you just some kids need more explicit help with that. Um, but I do think the opposite is true, that if you are a good writer and if you learn how to use that complex syntax and vocabulary peculiar to written language in your own writing, that makes you a better reader because you're in a much better position when you encounter those things in your reading, when you see a word like moreover, or you see you know, a, a lengthy sentence, if you know how to use and construct those things, you're much better able to understand it when you come across it in your reading. Yeah, I think you know, having been a musician before, uh, a lot of what I did in, in music actually transitioned into the way that I, I write, which is in music, especially if you're a guitar player, you see these different kinds of guitar players and you get the, the art of what they're doing after a while. It's not just the scales. You're not just practicing scales going up and down. You know the difference between Stevie Ray Vaughan and, and Jimi Hendrix, and you know the difference between Steve Vai and, and um, you know, um, any other guitars, you know, um, um, George Benson and whatever. And mm -hmm. each one of them adds something to the mix of your artistry. So as you're playing, because you're, taking in what they do and watching them so closely, all of a sudden you start kind of developing capacities, like things mm -hmm. in which that show up in your art. Well, in writing, I can remember like um, being stuck in some places, James Baldwin, just how beautiful and elegant the writing was. So reading it um, gave me appreciation for beauty in writing. And I would start actually, some of his flourishes would end up being my flourishes. Yeah, um, yeah. I tripped upon Peggy Noonan at some point and George Will, like mm -hmm. and and the thing about them was I didn't really care what they were writing about. Yeah, like I was reading them; they had such a gift. Their gifts became my gifts in some ways. It was, I was able to you know extrapolate mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing I'm always interested in is gossip. Um, so <laughs> let's gossip about history real quickly because I'm always in the education world. As I, I, I fairly I consider myself fairly uh, like a civilian. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm an enthusiast and hobbyist. I love education as a topic and to, as a parent and as an activist to just know what really goes down and why we're not getting things right or whatnot. So when I hear things like the wars, the reading wars, right? I wanna know what happened. Like, you know, where, how is it? Well, first of all, how are educated people having wars? Um, but you know, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, it seems like people are arguing about the way that we should approach this. And in the seventies, it feels like all hell breaks loose. Like, um, and, and in reading specifically, I, I saw something that you, you gave a speech and you were talking about, um, who is it that did like the five pillars? The, um, oh, that's the national reading panel. The report came, that right. came out in 2000. Okay, so four of the five pillars in in their report you were okay with, but the fifth one was comprehension, and you said that one caused some issues or uh, yeah. whatever. I'm always so interested in that. Tell me what goes down in a situation like that. 
Oh, well, I'm not up on the gossip. I hate to disappoint you, but <laughs> I, can, I can give you a little background on, I mean, so this national reading panel was convened, essentially, this was an effort to end the reading wars. Um, and the re- so the reading wars, I mean, that was really more about the decoding. It was really entirely about the decoding side of reading. They really weren't talking about comprehension. It was what is the best way to teach kids how to decode or sound out or read words. And the two camps were those who uh, felt that it was enough to just surround kids with good, good literature. And, and I mean, it's more kind of this Dewey-esque, uh, let's, let's let them discover thing, this for themselves and they'll figure it out. And the premise, the assumption was that like speaking, reading was this sort of natural process that all kids would just sort of pick up. On the other side were people who uh, advocated, teach, you, you got to teach, not all, every kid's going to need it, but most kids to become good readers are going to need systematic instruction in phonics, in, in how to, first of all, hear the sounds in words, that's called phonemic awareness, and then connect them to letters and combinations of letters. Um, and that, you know, that we've been speaking for a lot longer as a human race, uh, for a lot longer than we've been reading. And, and the, our brains are not going to just naturally figure out how to read for, for many of us. And so uh, this, I, I would say the, the, these reading wars really erupted in the 1990s when in California, California adopted uh, as a state an approach to reading that, that it embraced this, what was called whole language theory, that kids would just pick it up. You didn't really need to teach phonics. And around that, shortly thereafter, their test scores on national tests plummeted. Maybe it wasn't related. It, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I think there were a lot of factors there, but it led to a kind of reaction against this whole word approach and in, in back to phonics, in favor of phonics. And the National Reading Panel, they found a whole lot of evidence that what really need, was needed for a lot of kids was systematic instruction in phonics. And, you know, the phonics advocates would say, and I would agree, that maybe some kids aren't going to need it, but it's not going to hurt any kids. And pretty much all kids will benefit to some degree. And some are actually never going to learn to read unless you do this instruction in systematic phonics. And so the National Reading Panel, were, what they did was they just reviewed a whole bunch of studies. It's kind of like a meta-analysis. and. Um, <laughs> They came up with like four things that they called four pillars of early literacy instruction for which they had found evidence. Now, this wasn't meant to sketch out a curriculum, this, so, but people have, have taken these as, okay, these are the five things we need to teach. And so one was phonemic awareness, hearing those sounds. One was phonics. One was fluency, which is a often overlooked sort of the bridge between uh, decoding and comprehension. Now that means you have to be able to read at an appropriate pace and with appropriate expression. That helps you understand what you're reading. Then the other two pillars were vocabulary and comprehension. And I also have a problem with vocabulary because, um, I mean, I don't know exactly what they endorse because I haven't read those studies, but kids, in order to become good readers, they have to acquire a huge number of words in their early years of schooling, maybe like eight, eight word, new words a day. And you just can't teach all those words directly. It's impossible. The way to expand vocabulary, really the only way to expand vocabulary at the rate we need to is through building knowledge, because then you get these networks of words, you hear them repeatedly, and it's an, an engaging context. So I would say that that vocabulary thing I also have some problems with. Um, but um, in addition, then the fifth pillar is comprehension. And all they looked at, there were these studies of these, do teaching, does teaching comprehension strategy, does that boost comprehension on like standardized tests? And they found a bunch of studies that showed that did. And that was taken as an endorsement of this approach of teaching comprehension, not just strategies, but also the skills, um, when, in fact, those studies lasted generally no more than six weeks. And we do this year after year, you know, and we teach these same round of skills, um, and that's become the center of the curriculum. And there's really no evidence to support that. And so what the National Reading Panel really omitted to mention was the role of knowledge in comprehension. And that's one reason I think it's been so overlooked. You think it's been overlooked because the the knowledge part, not that comprehension isn't important, 
but because just focusing on comprehension and not on knowledge is not actually sufficient. Yeah, I mean, the, so we have what we we have these studies that show if you teach comprehension strategies for six weeks, or maybe as one scientist was, we kind of a psychologist has looked, he, he examined the data and he said, really, after two weeks, you don't really get much bang for the buck. So the kids, the, anything they're going to get from this comprehension strategy teaching, they're probably going to get after two weeks. Um, and there are studies that also show that knowledge is hugely important to comprehension, prior knowledge of the topic. Like if you know about baseball, you will be able to understand a passage describing a baseball game a lot better than somebody who doesn't know a lot about baseball. What we don't have are studies showing that if you spend, now a lot of these research studies are six weeks. If you do, if, if you build kids' knowledge about something they don't already know about for six weeks and then you give them a standardized reading test that may have nothing to do with the topic you've built their knowledge about, just you're not going to necessarily see results improved results on that standardized test, but why would you? The thing is that building knowledge is a gradual cumulative process. And so measuring the effects, it gets very complicated. You need multi-year longitudinal stuff. And the problem there is it's really hard to control the variables. And also these knowledge building curricula haven't been around that long, so we can't do that. But you know, you have kids moving in and out of schools, you have teachers doing things in different ways. It's just much harder to do those kinds of studies. Um, and I think that's one reason that there's been this assumption that all we need to do to teach reading comprehension is teach these skills and strategies. We don't have to worry about building knowledge. That's what I mean. You know, Robert Pondisio is the first person that I would go back and forth with, where I found it surprising, because he's, you know, uh, I don't want to speak for him and in, in, position him politically, but he's what I would consider more conservative than liberal um, on these issues. So I would have assumed long, long back when we started talking about these things, I would have assumed that he would be for testing, standardized testing for one and the accountability movement. But he was one of the first people to say to me, like, that surprised me. Like, no, I don't think reading it lends itself like good reading practice uh, uh, and instructional practice doesn't lend itself to being tested in the way that we're testing it right now. What I've always said to people about standard, and I listen, I'm, I'm going to just be out there and out myself. I am a defender of standardized testing, period. Um, um, but what I would always ask people is, let's not talk about it and debate it. As a parent, go to your own state's website, your state's Department of Education website, look for the sample tests and ask yourself a very simple question. Um, look at the sample test items and say to yourself, is this something that my third grader should be able to do? And if you say to yourself, no, I don't think that this is something that my third grader should be able to do, then you're probably, you know, you have a claim against standardized testing. But until seeing it and actually talking about brass tacks and seeing what, seeing it for real, it's hard to know what, how you feel about it. And when I do that, I go look at it. I think to myself, Maybe this isn't the example test item I would use. Maybe this isn't the question that I would ask, but my kids should be able to do it. Like, right, like so, I want my kids to be able to do it. So I wanna show you one just like from here in Minnesota. So this is like a test, uh, this is a uh, example. In Minnesota, I think most states do this. They give you kind of a, a sample, a sampler of the test items for parents and community members, you can go take a look. This one's for third grade, third grade reading MCA, which is our state, you know, test item sample. So, you know, it, it's, you know, it's trying to be culturally broad minded, right? So it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's, 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 it's about a different culture. Um, it's asking you to read a passage and it's asking you what sentence best describes uh, the main character at the beginning of the story. Um, he is shy, he is proud, he is sad and tries and learns more. He is kind and generous to others, whatnot. What's wrong with this as a as a test item. I, I shouldn't even, do you think there's anything wrong with it? Or, you, know, you know, I don't have my reading glasses on and, yeah. this, and my screen, this print is very small. So oh, sorry. I'm, I'll see if I can, <laughs> I don't know if I can make it any bigger, let's see. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I would like to just back up for a minute and speak more generally about my view of testing. Um, I, I don't know, maybe I can, I see this is about India, right? A village in Northern India. Yes. You know, the first passage is like once upon a time, a young man named Madden uh, lived in a village in northern India 
And, you know, it tells a little bit of the story about the person. There's three sections to the story that it's telling. No, actually, there's more. It, it, it numbers them all the way down, actually, mm. passage by passage, right, or, right. Or with each passage. And then it asks you a question. Which sentence best describes uh, the main character who's, who's Madden at the mm. beginning of the story? And you have four options. He mm. is shy and works quietly. He is proud and seeks greatness. He is sad and tries to learn more. He is kind and generous to others. Mm -hmm. And this is third grade, by the way, I should say this is third grade. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and, and so your question to me is, is there anything wrong with this? Well, I mean, in terms of testing, like my question about it is, should my kid be able to know how to do this? Like, like as a parent, my kid is facing this. This is something my kid's going to take. Mm -hmm. And my question yeah. around it has to be, if they're a good reader, should first of all, is it age appropriate? You know, this is, you know, a third grader. So I have a fourth grader now. So last year would have been her first year in third grade. Mm -hmm. Do I think she should be able to read this passage and tell me um, mm -hmm. what best describes the character at the beginning mm -hmm. and, and to know the difference between, you know, shy and proud and sad and kind and generous and those things and be able to, you know, read closely enough to make a decision mm -hmm. on what those things are. Um, and, and, I'm assuming that you feel she should be able to do that. Absolutely. Like, yeah. you know, like if she, if, if, if your kid could and mine couldn't, I would think that that was a problem. Yeah. Oh, I agree with you. Um, I mean, that particular question, you might be able to answer. Well, you'd obviously need to know the meanings of words like shy and generous. Um, but, you know, I, I haven't been able to read that whole uh, story. That seems like a question you could answer without having a whole lot of background knowledge about Northern India or whatever. Um, but there are test passages and there are questions that do assume more that I've seen that assume more background knowledge than that. But I would say, you know, generally I'm not against testing per se. I think standardized tests have uncovered a lot of inequities in our system that had been hidden. Um, it's a question of what we use those tests for. And, you know, those tests were never constructed to be a guide to instruction or curriculum. And yet that has been to some extent what they've become. And they've, be, they've also become um, a distraction or, or an obstacle to getting teachers and administrators and the whole education system to embrace a focus on content because they look at the tests. And I mean, I've had teachers say this to me, there's not gonna be a question about, you know, where the Navajo lived or sedimentary rock or whatever, my kids aren't gonna be held accountable for knowing that. They're gonna be held accountable for finding that, being able to find the main idea, et cetera. So that's what I have to focus on. And the, you know, the unpredictability of the content on the test, sure, I mean, some of it's gonna be reasonable, but who knows what is gonna be on there. That, you know, it's impossible to really prepare kids for those tests. Um, I would mention a couple of, ideas to address that and, and still uh, have, ensure the kind of accountability we want tests to ensure. One is uh, an experiment, a pilot that's going on in Louisiana, actually, I guess I gather that's your home state, uh, where they've done a lot of innovative things in education. And one of them is to have this under ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, there is a provision for an innovative kind of Read test, reading test. And what Louisiana is experimenting with is a, a reading test that instead of just using random topics for reading passages and thereby really essentially testing just kids' general knowledge, those reading passages are going to be connected to the state's curriculum, not only in ELA, English language arts, but also social studies. Um, this is starting with middle school. And, and Louisiana has created a curriculum that's being used in like 80% of classrooms. So they they can do this. They can link the assessment to, and it's not just going to be, you know, identify where this passage came from or something like that. They're going to ask analytical questions, but the kids will, you know, have a much better chance of actually having the knowledge they need to be able to answer those questions. So I think that's one promising route that maybe I would hope other states at some point could follow. I mean, the, the other thing I would say is, um, test designers, instead of keeping their the topics of test passages a closely guarded secret, could say something like, okay, on the fourth grade reading test this year, we're going to cover four of the following eight topics. And that would both help level the playing field and give all students a fighting chance of being able to demonstrate their skills. And secondly, it would give teachers an incentive to focus on teaching the content and not just the skills. 
So um, we're getting closer to time, but you know, this is the time where I usually drop something that requires an entirely different show, and I do it all the time. <laughs> um, but here's my commentary on the on on all of this, which is, I actually believe that this isn't a solvable problem that we're doomed to fail for one reason, which is I don't believe the common school is the way to go. I don't think educators will ever agree on things and that they will always default to the lowest common denominator of what they do agree on, nationally speaking. So if you set up standards, there's gonna be large scale arguments about what those standards should be. And whatever you do, whatever process you use, whoever you put at the table, they're gonna be doomed because well, one, because of history, this already happened. So I'm not speaking out of turn. We created standards over and over and over again as different states and as national associations and as collective bodies, as presidential councils, um, as philanthropies, as presidents who wanted to be the education president. And the one thing that has been recurring, the through line is your best efforts always will be criticized and critiqued as being insufficient or falling short because people have so many different ideas about what standards should be, what they should be used for. Um, when you talk about tests, I actually, I absolutely, if I'm gonna pump $700 billion into an education blob, I want some form of objective test and whatever, but what I'm realizing over time is it can't be one. There's never gonna be one that's not gonna get fought. 10 year, you put it in today, 10 years from now, someone will tear it down and get it out of there because they didn't like it from the day one. You set up standards today, five years from now or 10 years from now, someone will tear those standards down. They'll elect a person to come in and get rid of them because they didn't like them from day one and they spent five years, 10 years. And that is part of democracy, which is basically um, people don't want national standards. We talk about Finland, but we don't want Finland's national standards. Right. Um, Common Core, listen, came out of Republican governors, then got a, a Democratic spin to it. And it had national associations of educators right at the table. It had lots of practice on it or whatnot. And, you know, love it or hate it, it was either the greatest thing ever or it was a nail in the coffin of standards. As you, as you, you know, you have a chapter in one of your books that talks about mm -hmm. Common Core, talks about this. Um, so isn't the better idea to just let everybody do what they want to do and have choice, let parents just choose. If you want a better reading program, if you want the one where kids just do what they want, man, just do whatever they want, then cool, let there be a school for you. Uh, yeah, and if you I want mean, something uh, more disciplined, there'd be a school for you. Well, you know, I, um, I, I guess I hope you're wrong. <laughs> I, mean, I, I understand where you're coming from. There have been a lot of failed attempts here. Um, but uh, there's so many different, I mean, I would just say one pushback here is that I have been, and others have, been, I've heard, talked to others who have been to a lot of districts and schools around the country that are doing this. And they're, and the teachers, are, even some who were initially resistant, are saying, wow, this is so much better. It wasn't necessarily an easy adjustment, but my kids are so much more engaged. Their writing is so much better. They're, they're excited about what they're learning. I would never go back to what I was doing before. So I think that can be very powerful to experience that and for other teachers to see that happening. On standards, I think we took a wrong turn. Um, I, first of all, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not advocating for national standards. Um, I think we always will probably have state standards. That's not going to be sufficient because you also need curriculum to implement those standards that are good. The, the real problem that I see with standards are standards that have no content. And this is true not just of the Common Core literacy standards, but many state literacy or ELA standards that they just read like a list of skills. And that doesn't work You because that leads to, kid, to teachers thinking, okay, I need to teach the standards. I need to teach the skills. And you can't do that. You can't teach the abstract skill of, let's take it from the Common Core, connecting a claim to evidence in text. Again, it's going to depend on whether you have the knowledge to understand that text, right? Um, so I do think that message needs to get across. At the very least, what I'm hoping is people will understand why what we've been trying to do for the last, I don't know how many decades, and certainly the last two decades, has not been working. Um, um, well, I would love to be wrong. <laughs> I would love to be wrong. I, I'm a little fatigued 
with what seem to be um, forever arguments, like the, the arguments, like we just talked about in the 70s, there being an argument and in the 80s and in the 90s, we experienced um, one state doing something and in other states having to have a, you know, um, a reckoning around these things. It doesn't seem like the reckoning is ever over. Like we ever just land on yeah. something and roll with it. You know, I want to say one more thing about choice and I'm not against choice. And I, as I said, I was on the board of a charter school and I, I I think what you're ending up advocating is, you know, let just let let parents go where they want to go. Yes. And I, I have sympathy for that. But the one problem is there hasn't been that much choice in terms of what I'm describing, in terms of content in the elementary curriculum and whether kids are getting access to sexually substantive knowledge. The charter schools like the one I was on. You know, they historically, I would say they've been the worst offenders in this area. They have focused laser in a laser like way on those comprehension skills. Some of them are trying to change, but a lot of that has to do with the way we've been using test scores. And they want to make sure they're they're going to get the scores on those tests because that's how we evaluate and th those schools. And that's how parents are able to identify the quote unquote good schools. Mm -hmm. I can I could support and see a, a possible poten more potential in a choice system is instead of evaluating schools just on the basis of even their growth in test scores, we evaluate it on the basis of how well they're building kids' knowledge on the basis of their curriculum. But that, as far as I know, never enters into those rating systems. So, well, and um, I think that depends on the school, right? Like that depends on. I mean, there are some schools that are, you know, like uh, the Hirsch, you know, framework is there is. The guiding principle of how they run their schools in some of the schools, right? Like, yeah, very, very so. few charter schools like that, and that's not Ooh, even. That's not true. I mean, <laughs> I can name them. <laughs> I, I mean, I can name some too, yeah, yeah. but I mean, well, listen, I, I'm looking locally in Washington D.C., where I know the charter landscape best. Yeah, there are some that are doing like expeditionary learning things, and there are some. I only know one that's doing core knowledge language arts, which is initially created by Hirsch's foundation. But, you know, parents are busy. And even highly educated parents in D.C., where almost 50 percent of the kids are in charter schools and there is a real proliferation of choices, even highly educated parents have a hard time figuring out which school is going to be better and how am I going to get my kids to that school and does it have an after school program? There are lots of different things that parents are trying to figure out. And curriculum, because I think I, myself as a parent, my kids are grown now, but, you know, like, I wasn't really focusing on curriculum, and I think that's true for most parents, but it's hugely important, and we don't help them identify the schools that have the curriculum that's likely to serve their kids the best. This is why I go back to, though, choice for one, because if I'm a parent who listens to you, or I buy your books and I read your book, and then I get really enthused about this as a way, as a great way for us to do education for my kid and whatnot, I could do a couple of things. One, I could look for a school that lives out these values and and um, and this and adopts the science and and <laughs> and and respects the science and goes with it, or I could become an activist and try and fight systems with my local superintendent to adopt a better focus on what the science says and watch that superintendent leave in three years and another one come in and get them to do it too. And then watch them leave in three years and, you know, rinse and repeat. Right. And each one of them comes in and, um, and oftentimes they come in and give you a big a PowerPoint of everything they're going to do. And reading isn't even in there. Like what they're going to do around yeah. reading isn't even, you know, we're going to change the boundaries. We're going to move kids around. We're going to do all these other things. And oh, by the way, you know, there's this reading program that we had in my last um, um, district that I'm going to bring with me to the new district or whatnot. And it's going to happen over and over again. So it's hard for parents, I think, to make something durable and lasting at a system level, but not yeah. so much at a school level. Like a school probably could do it longer. You know, um, I, I understand what you're saying. And I, you know, I, I, I would respect either choice, but I will just mention what something that popped into my head when I, I was interviewing a parent who was very upset here that the public school where she was sending her kids here in Washington, D.C. had basically eliminated social studies and, and science and, and in violation of the D.C. public schools, you know, supposed curriculum that was out there. And they were just doing these reading comprehension skills over and over again. And she was not highly educated herself, but she she saw something was wrong here. And she, she knew there were kids at other schools that were getting to do projects and things like that, that her kids weren't getting. And I said to her, 
she had testified at a DC council hearing about this. this. And I, I said, well, why not take your kids out of the school they're in now and, and get them into one of those other schools? And she said, no, I thought about that, but I don't want to leave all those other kids behind, the kids who are at my kid's school now. Mm-hmm. I want to mm-hmm. make sure that they get a better education too. So I'm keeping my kids in that school. So I, I, I respect that too. I respect that choice. <laughs> That's a choice, right? Yeah. And I respect it. Like I still tell people all the time, I will fight for your right to put your kid in a jacked up school if you stop blocking my right to put my kid in a school that I think works for them, right? So if we could just get out of each other's business and all have a choice. Like mm-hmm. and the problem with, in America, to me, the biggest problem in America is that people can't get out of each other's business, right? <laughs> like, yeah. and, and I might- It's part of democracy, maybe. <laughs> it's part of a democracy, but like, like, I have a very don't tread on me situation going on with the way I want to educate my kids. Mm-hmm. And and that might just require us to settle all bets, be like, you don't, you and I don't have to agree on what the curriculum mm-hmm. should be or any of that. We should just agree that I should be able to find like a knowledge rich um, curriculum for my kids, if you don't want one, like you may not want mm-hmm. that. Having been on a school board to see how we try to um, settle differences with each other becomes very hard. Educators, when I first came onto a school board, educators were fighting about math. So we split the difference with a watered down version that 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 was what neither one of the groups wanted, but it was something in the middle they could accept. We did the same thing with reading and science and with other, uh, uh, other issues. Um, and parents would be on one side or the other, politicians would be on one side or the other, and educators would be on one side or the other, and we would settle the difference. And what we came up with most of the times was insufficient for everybody. It was mm-hmm. like a dumbed down average of what they wanted. Um, so that, that's where part of my cynicism comes from. As we wrap at the end, and I should have said this earlier, I do want people to see and and know about this article that you wrote for Forbes, um, because you know we're in times right now where um, cities are burning, people are re- rethinking what equity really is for um, for their cities. And you wrote something um, um, basically saying that at this time when we're looking at all of those things, we should also be thinking about the fact that um, equity um, also involves this issue that we're talking about right now and that we are actually doing a disservice um, to kids of color. Um, The article is called uh, How Reading Instruction Fails Black and Brown Children. You wrote it for Forbes um, June 6th. So for people watching this or listening, I think you should, you know, check this out and and read it. But could you quickly just make the argument? What's the main argument that you're making here in this piece? Well, I, I, I'm not saying that it only fails black and brown kids because it's also failing a lot of uh, well, white kids, any kid uh, who is not coming in with a fund of academic knowledge from home. But uh, certainly living in Washington, D.C., the classrooms that I've been in where I have seen this approach to comprehension really not work for kids have been all those classrooms have been all kids of color. And, you know, in every classroom I've ever been in, I've seen all sorts of potential kids who are curious and eager, and I'm talking early elementary, and they ask really good questions, but I've, and I've seen, and this is not the fault of teachers, it's the, the way the system has developed and the training that the teachers have used. Instead of in nurturing that curiosity and, and answering those questions, they said, well, we're not talking about that because what we're really talking about is the difference between, you know, a caption and a subtitle, because that's the kind of skill that you're really going to need. Um, and what ends up happening is we waste tremendous amount of potential and it falls disproportionately. If we look at racial and ethnic lines, it definitely falls, has a disproportionately negative impact on black and brown kids. And that strikes me as a tremendous inequity that, has not uh, drawn the attention that it really needs to. I mean, we, we do talk about racism, structural racism in the education system, and there's a, there's, there's a lot of other things, uh, but this, this aspect, what actually goes on in classrooms and, and how it doesn't line up with science, we haven't focused on that as, as a racial justice issue, and I think that is definitely one aspect of it. I appreciate you for your time today, Natalie. Um, this has been great. As always, I'm learning. So every day that we have these conversations is a learning situation for me and hopefully for the people that watch and um, and the audience. 
Um, I think it's amazing that people will come in and watch these things and listen to these things every day because I nerd out on them, but I actually believe that um, it's not always accessible to a broader audience. People in, this is a small critique, not of your work, but just in general. I think most of the writing around education, um, philosophy, theory, politics, commentary are aimed at college educated people. So oftentimes the biggest and best debates that we're having about how we educate our kids are happening between the minority of Americans that are college educated um, talking to themselves. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the thing that I love is the bridge, the translators to civilians, to people who, um, <laughs> number one, have the majority of kids in these systems, yeah. um, <laughs> right? And two, how do we make the language and the, the, these type of meaningful discussions real for them? Um, ways that they can access, access. And I think it starts with treating everybody as intelligent beings, right? Like yeah. not pretending like, you know, oh my God, this might be above you. No, it's not above you, <laughs> right? Like these are easy to understand um, things. But at the end of this, um, I love books and I love giving away books and I love other people to read the books and then come back to me and tell me what they think. So if you have made it all the way to the end here, which I'm looking at the numbers, many of you have. So I'm very happy about that and proud about that. Um, I'm giving away um, Natalie's book. So Natalie has two, ha has one book that definitely is germane to our discussion today, which is around the knowledge gap. Also has a book with another co-author around the writing revolution, which we didn't talk much about today because we, we spoke mostly about reading, but I think both are really important. Um, so what I want to do is I'm dropping down right now um, my assistant's email address into the comments and um, the first five people who get in touch with me will get a copy of Natalie's book. Um, um, the knowledge on the knowledge gap or the writing revolution. I prefer the you you. It's your choice because I believe in choice and freedom of choice. Which are the two? But I think the first one is more germane to our discussion today. The second one is more germane to a discussion I hope we have in the future, Natalie. If you were to come back again, I'd love, I'd love to. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, guys. I just dropped the email in there. Um, send an email. Mention the name the name and the author of the book because. My assistant is getting uh, um, backed up with messages that don't always specify which which show. So do that. Um, Natalie, thank you so much. I appreciate you. And um, this was a great conversation. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chris. I really enjoyed this. It's great talking to you. So for our listeners and watchers, this has been an hour and more with uh, Natalie Wexler, uh, education author, writer, reporter, and uh, her book, her two books we're giving away. But if you want to reach her, she's at um, on Twitter at Nat Wexler, and that's N A T W E X L E R. Um, and Natalie, I don't know if there's any other way that you want folks to get in touch with you. Um, they can. Uh, I have a website, nataliewexler.com, and there's a contact page. You could send me an email through that. Perfect. Look how easy that is. <laughs> Thank